about some of the changes that are occurring and um, talk to you about maybe roles. Maybe that will help to begin with, the roles of different people in the building. When I first came here, it was clear to me that we just did not have enough STNAs. And I think everybody would agree with that. We, we don't have the hands-on, we don't have the care that we need. And, as, and that became evident because I was looking at benchmarks. And the benchmarks are <coughs> things that, um, that CMS, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare, have determined are important things to look at. So benchmarks might be skin, the amount of skin breakdown, or it could be um, falls or infections, any number of things. So our benchmarks don't look that pretty, to be honest. And so coming in the door, it's a new place, new, new job for me. I want to know what the benchmarks look like. They don't look horrible, but they, they're really not, they're not where they should be. So these benchmarks are important because this is what state looks at. So then when I look at why wouldn't, this, this is a good home. This is a wonderful home with people with longevity, with good hard people, and they have skills. So in my mind, I'm like, how would that be possible? And I look, and we don't have the foundation. We don't have the nursing assistants. So we don't have that hands-on care. So it kind of felt like then the expectation was for the nurse, the LPN on the cart, to fill in for where we didn't have the nursing assistants. Are you feeling that a little bit? Like if you don't have the nursing assistant, then you have to go in and turn somebody. You have to catch a light. You have to catch this or that. While you should be able to do that, I don't think that's a requirement. Um, because you have the nursing assistants in theory, <laughs> but we didn't have them. So it made sense to me that we really need to hire a bunch, and we don't have enough yet. But we've hired probably over 20. I would say there's a good over 20 in the last two months. Some have come in, some haven't, some stayed, some didn't, some had to leave. They just weren't. Mostly, it's, mostly they, they just didn't work out for whatever reason. But we do have more than we did. And so we do have those days where we actually do have a full complement of staff. And I'm not sure for a while we ever had those days. So we're making some progress, but it's not enough. We've got to have more at the ground level to make sure the care is there. And then comes the idea of your uh, the charge nurse. And <coughs> someone left here recently. She was an LPN. <clears throat> and she said, I've never been a charge nurse. I've always been a staff nurse. I don't think I can be a charge nurse, so I'm leaving. I'm like, and I know this person. I know this person's history. I know this person is known as being very tough in his STNAs. So that kind of sends the message to me that they've always, that person's always been a charge nurse because that person took charge of their area. That The difference between a staff nurse and a charge nurse is the staff nurse does prime primary care kind of does their thing with their little group of people, all on their own, by themselves. A charge nurse has a group of residents, probably a larger group, and has a full complement of nursing assistants, um, make sure that the housekeeper's in there, and if not, goes to Kelly, um, make sure that, the, that there's an opportunity for activities, make, make sure the family's happy, make sure the doctor's contacted. That's a charge nurse, they take charge of their stuff. Now, if there is uh, somebody that's going bad, there's somebody that, you, that has fallen, if there's somebody that's hurt themselves, that char charge nurse then will seek additional help, you know, manager or a supervisor. That's kind of how the line goes, in my mind. You know, we got into a, a conversation earlier today a little bit about um, the charge nurses from the doctors. And I think there maybe has been a history of only the supervisors calling the doctors. And while there's, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, other than I believe the charge nurses have the best information. I believe the charge nurses know their residents. And I believe the charge nurses need to connect to the doctors because of that. When I first came here, I saw, I was overhearing a conversation between a supervisor and, and that, that's going to be complicated because we have supervisors in the building. But there was a supervisor who was talking to the doctor about a patient who had a problem. It wasn't critical, but it was a problem. And the supervisor was off the top of her head coming up with the answers. 
But they were wrong, and I knew because I'd already looked into it. I'd already talked to the nurse. I'd already done my stuff. And the answers, the information given to the doctor was not correct. Because the supervisor didn't know, because the supervisor hadn't been there. The charge nurse knows. But in all fairness, the supervisor was told they were the only ones who talked to the doctors. That was the model that they had. So she was off the top of her head doing the best she could. But it wasn't good information. That's not good nursing. Just, you know, she knew the resident. She was, oh, I think this or that. It wasn't true. So I go back to the model. Uh, the charge nurse needs to run their group of patients. As legal just said, you're responsible. You are responsible to make sure the care is given, even when you delegate. And that goes back to holding the aides accountable in a fair, consistent way. And if you get feedback from your aides that is not what you expect, you can do a number of things. You can say, you can approach them and say, um, I'm not okay with you saying this. And it's still, the care needs to be given. And if they still give you pushback, you go, you follow chain of command. And I don't mind at all if you talk to me about it. I would prefer you go to either a supervisor or to the unit manager, because in all fairness, they want to know what's going on. They don't want you going over their head. But if you have problems, I don't mind at all you doing that, if that makes sense. So <clears throat> the role then, of the unit manager during the day is to oversee 24-hour care for their group of residents and to support the staff in doing that. So when we think about that, um, there have been all kinds of rumors and things, you know how it gets in the family like we have here. But the reality is that they need to raise up the charge nurses, teach them everything we've got, Put things in your hands. And then if you can't do it, if you're overwhelmed, then say, I don't think I'm going to be able to get to that. And then the unit manager will step in. If it's day shift, the unit manager will step in and say, well, let me do this, and I will help with that. Or maybe we can call so-and-so. But ultimately, it's your show. You're running your show. If you have 10 residents and you're getting an admission, I think you should know how to do the new admissions. I do. If you have 10 residents and one of them is just sick and you can't get away from the bedside, you're not sure how you're going to even do the other nine, then you tell your nurse manager and your nurse manager does that. Um, that's the admission. <clears throat> now, my understanding is you guys have been doing all the admission except the COC anyway. <clears throat> like you do all the assessments. That's my understanding. The COC is delicate. It's, it's difficult. you gotta, you got to go through it item by item, figure it out. You guys are smart people. You're nurses, for God's sake. You can figure that out. But it's time consuming, and I know it's time consuming, and you always run the risk of missing something. And doggone it, if I miss something, they're going to be on my back. I get that. I was a charge nurse. I get that. So who wants to take the risk of that when you're busy? So under those circumstances, you go to your unit manager and they teach you. They guide you. They take part of it. They take all of it, whatever. There will be some nurses that will love the idea of doing their admission because they will know that person from top to bottom. They will look at the orders, and if they don't agree within the order, they'll, they'll flag it, and when they call the doctor to verify the orders, they'll say, but you know what? We don't do that in here. And then they'll get that off their first thing. They will trim that COC and put it on the physician order, and they will make sure the MAR and the TAR are right, if you have time. If you've got 35 patients and it's busy, you don't have enough aids, blah, 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 you may not have time. So then you work in partnership with your uh, unit manager and your supervisor. <clears throat> that's just nursing, you know, and that's how I see it. So I don't know that it was conveyed that way, or maybe I didn't convey it to the nurse managers that way. Maybe I wasn't clear, and, and I'm sorry if that is true, but that's how I see it. The supervisors, <clears throat> I, one of the supervisors said that she wasn't going to be able to touch the Mars and Tars for changeover. I never said that. I think that's just a continuation of rumors, you know. I wouldn't say that. That's goofy. Of course. Mars and Tars, as long as we have them, my shift has to do it. Supervisors have to make it happen. Um, eventually, as soon as our Mars and Tars, as soon as Sean gets all this going, we won't have changeover. Not in the traditional sense. It'll all go into the magic computer and it'll come out in, in the pretty world and we'll all be happy. There'll be bluebirds everywhere and everything will be good. 
Yeah, there is certain. Well, you know, when I first was involved with going all computer, I, I hung on with a death grip to the old forms because I was going to check everything. I didn't trust the computer. It's just a machine, right. you know. But as it turns out, it's much more trustworthy than anyone thought. It's more accurate. Really. Yeah, yeah. Paper. There's that. So it turned out to be better. Um, the supervisor's role is to supervise. The supervisor's role is to support. <clears throat> they do what the nurse on the floor can't do. Excuse me. <clears throat> they, um, but they have their own roles too. There's a family that's saying we don't answer their call lines, and it's a big deal. You know who it is. Yeah. And so we were already doing call light audits because there were other families complaining. And let's face it, things are a little sluggish with call lights. God bless you. And <clears throat> things are sluggish with call lights, and people need to know, the aides need to know, we're looking at this very strongly because we're getting a lot of family complaints. But in this case, I think people do answer her call light because they don't let the family call. And I don't think it's at all the length of time, 45 minutes to an hour, like she's saying. But what do I do then? I call the supervisor and say, can you make sure you do the call light audits in this room throughout the night? Because we're meeting next week with a family and we want to show them we, we've looked at this and this is what we've audited and this is what we're finding. Because I think the sons are figuring it out that you know mom's getting a lot of attention from this and it's kind of fun because of that. So we want to have proof. So that's something that I asked the supervisor to do. So you know that's nothing really new but I just want to spell out that supervisor have their own roles. They do have to fix things. They do have to monitor things. But in no way are they not to support the nurses. I mean, you're in your little cubicle, your little house, your little world, you know, as a nurse. You're making sure that those 20, 30 patients are cared for and, and loved on and the families are happy when they call in. And you, you make, because whatever the disease is, it's a family disease. So you're going to make everybody happy. You're going to do that. But when it gets overwhelming, when you have a question, you're not sure what the answer is. When you need support, that's when the supervisor steps in. We don't have working supervisors here. A lot of homes will have a supervisor on a cart just so they have an RN in the building. We don't do that. We have that free floating because they're supposed to support you guys. <coughs> the ADONs. The ADONs, we have two. Um, one is actually staff development. So James is the teacher. If we get a peritoneal dialysis in here, and we will, then James is going to get somebody in here to teach, <clears throat> teach how to do it. And we will not go forward with it until we know we know how to do peritoneal dialysis. And James facilitates that. We have a new trait. We haven't had a trait in a long time. So James is going to get some training going and we will train for that. We're not going to leave anybody hanging. We're not going to set you guys up for failure. Um, there are standards throughout in the industry of um, in services that you guys have to attend through the year. James is going to set those up and make sure they're happy. In fact, what I didn't mention earlier today is we've got them online. So the nurse aides and you guys, there will be mandatory in services at your leisure that you can go in online and get. Um, <clears throat> we're just following um, you know, the, the rules, I guess. And he will then audit them. And if there's somebody missing some mandatory in services, he will be coming back and making sure that you get them. So you'll get memos and stuff. Not only that, but he does skin. James does. So when we have skin issues, then he's the one who manages that program. Now having said that, the charge nurses have to look at their skin because that's one of our big deals. You know, we, we need to make sure that we know what's going on with skin in the building. So when your aide takes somebody to the shower, and I it's... Follow. Do you? Good for you. <clears throat> you got to make sure you know. Watch them, take them to the shower. Say to your aides in the morning, especially if it's a new one, when you go to the shower, you so and so let me know. You know, because you got it. You got to know your skin. And then you tell your unit manager, who then tells James. Tell the supervisor if there's a problem. You know, if there's a problem. That's when we let James know so he can get involved. James also is overstaffing. So as Tina does staffing, she reports directly to James. Indirectly to me, but directly to James. Um, so, 
and we'll talk a little bit about financials. And I'm not going to keep you forever, but I just want you to know what I know and what I've been told to do and how my thinking is and stuff like that. So <clears throat> anyway, he does that now. Dawn is our other deal, and she's over clinical. She is the clinical poobah. And she makes sure that if we have problems clinically, that she fixes them, she oversees them, she's the go-to person. If a manager is busy with other things managing, then um, Don is the go-to person. She does the quality, the quality is now quality assurance. Quality comes from the old Indian term, not it doesn't really. Quality is quality assurance improvement program or something like that, that the state put together for us. So we have to follow the rules the way state wants us to. And we're putting that together and getting start, started with that. Um, she also does restorative. She oversees restorative, even though Glenna does restorative, Don oversees it, and MDS, among other things. But those are some big ticket items that Don does. So if you find yourself with questions or needing support or just frustrated in, in that category, in those categories, that's your go to. Usually the, your unit managers are, but the unit managers are busy because their their whole world has changed from supervisor to unit manager, and it's a it's a big difference, and they're learning it, and uh, it's been challenging, and we've had some tough morning meetings, and, and they're learning it, and so that's why it's so good that we have the DONs that we can go to. Um, my role is I came in with the idea, I came in with Kevin telling me what to do, and so I'm a dutiful subserving at DON, I'm going to do what my boss tells me to do. And one of those things was we missed budget last year. We missed budget huge last year. Not like huge like some of the homes, but huge enough. And so why did we do that? We didn't do it for census purposes. You know, usually if you don't have enough census, you don't meet budget, which is why admissions are so critical. If you want your raises and you want staff, you got to have admissions because we have got to have census. But having said that, we actually missed it last year by salaries. And the salaries are because we have enough overtime that it hurt. But not only that, now that I think about it, um, we didn't trim. So when census drops, we have to trim staff. Now hopefully we stay high on census all the time. We don't have to do that. But this building hasn't been known to, to do that, is my understanding. So financially, we had to really look at some hard moves, some hard changes. So some of those changes are the differences in the scheduling. We don't want to cut. We don't want to cut anybody. We don't want to lose any staff because we're cutting back because of financial. We don't want to reduce, make somebody who's full time part time. We don't want to do any of that. But the twelve hour shifts did cut enough that it made it sense. Made sense of it. And there are, there are other things that I have to do that are based on advancing excellence, which is from CMS, and the Ohio Board of Nursing Department in Initiative, and person-centered care. The various things that the initiatives are telling us they want to see in here went in place quite a few years ago. But, and I found out yesterday as I'm reporting this, because I have to report to the state and to the government things, I'm reporting it and we're saying we're doing some of this that we're not doing. So I don't want to do that, but I don't want to make us look bad. I don't know. So we've got to do this stuff. So I'm telling you what should have been done that wasn't done and what should be done that hasn't been started. I'm telling you these things so that we can get them underway. And it feels like a lot, and it is a lot. But nobody's going to do anything to you if you have questions about it or if you're not sure how to make it happen. But we just have to roll these things out. Person-centered care, for example, we have to do the dining room in a way that people feel like it's their dining room. We can't use bibs. We have to use napkins. They don't eat on the tray. It has to be off the tray. Honestly, the questions now have ramped up to, do they have a menu they can choose from? Or do they have a buffet they can pick their own meals from? That's what they're looking for, and we're nowhere near that, really. 
but at least let's not use bibs. You know what I mean? So we're rolling into this, and when you hear it, it's one more thing, what you want from us, we're working our butts off. But really, these are initiatives that we have to do. So we're trying to roll them out in such a way that it can be reasonably done. And and do it and then do it in such a way that we can trim our cost because one of the things that's going to cost us more money, and the, the group earlier mentioned, hey, this doesn't make any sense, but we've got to go more R and We are we went from a five star to a four star because of R and ratios. So like Kevin says, we can buy our way into a five star because we have to have more RNs. What's going to happen, and I don't know if it's next year, I don't know if it's in five years, but LPNs are going to be required to be at least in school. And RNs who are two-year RNs are going to be required, it's called BSN and 10, they're going to be required to get their BSN in 10 years. Now the hospitals have already started that. New York as a state has already BSN and 10, that's the expectation. But that's where we're headed. So. When you drill that down, when you look at our five star, they've already started with the whole RN thing. And the more RNs we have, the more stars we get. Then on top of that, the five star has changed, and it's harder. So whereas in the past, people knew how to get a five star, it's really complicated. It's, it's really ridiculously complicated. We had an end service about it, and it's like, you know, the whole survey thing, if you have complaints, if you have this or that, it hurts your five-star rating. But then it's actually become more difficult to get a five-star. So some of the five-star facilities are going down to three stars this year, and we've seen that. So of course we're going to try very hard not to do that for pride purposes, if not anything else, for so we can get admissions, because we have to have admissions to be successful. Um, so we want to stay at a five-star, close to stay no more, no less than four star, but we'd like to be a five star, but we're gonna have to work on that. And that's the that's the information that comes to me that I share with you. And that's why the changes in many cases have occurred. Um, our advancing excellence um, thing that we have we have many, many goals in advancing excellence. All the long term care facilities have them. Uh, I listed our four that somebody identified last year, and that's return to hospital, turnover, skin, and infections. And those will change, but we're not quite where we need to be with the four that we have. They expect us to solve these four and to choose another four and start working on them. That's the expectation. I should do that this month. It's time to move on, but we're not successful yet. So I'm going to see how they want us to roll that out. But Let's talk a minute about return to hospitals. What happened is the insurance companies were looking at the fact that hospitals were dumping their residents out too fast to long-term care. So in long-term care, we were getting residents that were too sick to manage. So then we were sending them back. When in doubt, when in doubt send them out. Remember that old phrase that we used for years? So we're sending them back because we didn't see, we, you know, if we thought somebody was going to go and was really sick, we'd send them back to the hospital. And um, the hospitals now, because the insurance companies have looked at them, are now not getting paid because within that first 30 days. They feel like they should be stabilized to come to us. So what's the hospital in return going to do? They won't send anybody to us because they feel like we can't handle it. It's not just us, it's throughout the, the whole cities, it's throughout the state. This is just how right. it is, back and forth. But typical hospital nursing home arguments, you know, that we've always had. Husband like that. <laughs> so what do we do? We ramp up what we can do. We try not to send them out. We treat them place. I don't want anybody to lay in here and die, for God's mm -hmm. sake. But if somebody has an upper respiratory infection and they need an antibiotic or their fluid deficit they need some IVs, we can do that with our system. We can put an IV in, we can give some oxygen, we can give a nebulizer treatment, we can, you can, I had, a, I worked with a, a supervisor that was evening shift, if she felt like somebody was dehydrated and their lives didn't look right, she made sure that, and she was always busy, a little busy girl, and she used to go in that room and offer like 30 cc's of fluid, like she was an IV, a working IV, every hour on the rounds, she'd make sure she was in that, that was her point to make. You know, whatever it takes to solve a problem, we need to take care of our residents. 
And, and the thing is, it might, that might be new news. That may be something you're not familiar with. And if so, then we just need to train it. And we need to teach and we need to raise people up and, and you know, ensure that you have the tools to do that and you feel comfortable in doing that. You know, that you're equipped, that you have the base STNAs to provide the care so that you're not in there toileting unless you want to be. You know, but you're not toileting, that you're overseeing the care of the resident. That you can go to your managers and the managers are ready to uh, assist with that and say, well, I would suggest you do that and do that. Because they're going to point you in directions. They're going to delegate. They're going to do that because they've got a boatload of stuff they have to do. But then you'll use their, you'll pick their brains and they'll help you do it until you get too busy and you can't do it. And then they'll step in and help you. So anyway, we're looking at infections. We have an infections issue. We do. It's, it's probably care related. But we did a QA. They put it in place a bunch of things for uh, MDU to help with that. Maybe it was viral. Maybe we just had a virus. Maybe it wasn't care issues. We're not sure. But when you have infections, there's an issue. When we're looking at pericare, maybe it's related to uh, proper, not pericare, when we're looking at UTIs, maybe it's related to proper peri pericare. Um, that's something that we ask James to look at. We, we look at all of our infections. We put them on a graph, make sense of it, and try to solve them. That's, that's what we're supposed to do at this level. Um, we have, when we look at floppy, we have this big outline of what CMS wants us to do. They want us to learn how to graph our issues. And then looking at the graph, make sense of it, and then put it in some sort of framework that QAPI makes sense and, and all that from graphs. And you know, when I first heard that, I thought, what happened to nursing here? This can't make, a, this can't possibly make a difference. And yet they did graphs on that. And don't you know? that the outcomes are, that people are improving and living longer and living better lives longer. And so, you know, it's hard to argue if people are getting better using these standards. And these standards are what we're told to do, so we can't do anything about it. So, I know, it's all over the place, but in a nutshell, that's kind of what we're working on. That's kind of why we're doing some of the things we're doing. I know we've lost some people. I don't want to lose people. I'm not trying to force anybody out, and I'm sorry we've lost people. If I've miscommunicated, I'm sorry for that. <coughs> but it's a facility. You know, what kind of, what is the primary focus of this facility? Resident care. Yeah. Who's the most important person in this facility? Residents. The residents. So we've got to, every time it's confusing, every time it's confusing, we've got to remember that. Because I want to, I would like for us to be good to each other. I believe in being good to each other. I, I hope that we can be good to each other. But I also know that our, our, I have to do my job. Don has to do her job. Marina has to do her job. She, we all have to do our jobs. We do. We get paid for doing our jobs. If we don't do our jobs, we don't have a job. You, ultimately, that's how it goes. We go away. And so I'm going to do my job. I'm going to do what my boss tells me to do. Because he's the one who determines what my job is within some clinical parameters. But it all hinges on the care of the resident. So those things have to balance and some they have to marry and they have to balance in some way. So we've got to trim money, we've got to take care of the resident. And wherever that pinches somebody, dang on it, I hate that because some people may determine they can't work in that environment. I'm sorry. But we'll try to make it as less painful as possible. And if you have questions, please come to me. My door's open all the time. Any questions, comments? While we have you here, the one thing you may want to address is the orders. Mm -hmm. The uh, taking off the orders. So, the originally, you know, what I said was church nurses need to be able to do admissions. Church nurses mm -hmm. need to. Not mm -hmm. done. Orders written and documenting how you're wanting them to document their orders now. Like you're having yeah, yes, notifying the family. family. Notifying the family, notifying the doctor. Because some of that's kind of new to them. I see. Well, we, we <coughs> I think you guys probably know that you have to notify your family and doctor for any new order. Is that new news? I thought the doctor would write the new order. 
Mm-hmm. Well, if you're writing the order. If the, if oh, the doctor's if written writing, it, then... Or if the doctor has written the order, but like when you're taking them off and stuff yeah. and you're checking, yeah. make sure you're writing in your documentation and your nursing note that the family has been, has been notified and the doctor has been notified. Even some orders that we're not used to, like therapy kind of stuff, we're not used to having to write those because you know therapy always writes their notes. But now they're wanting you to make sure so that everything flows. That okay. when you take off any order, just make sure you're writing it in your nursing notes now. And not just who you notified, not just power of attorney, it has to be their name. Mm-hmm. It has to be their name. It has to be their name. I just said family. family. Yeah. 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 Well, there's no going back. back. It's only going forward. And I know right. it's, it's not been clear. Okay. But if you don't do that, then Medicaid can come in and audit the therapy. And therapy is a huge money issue. I mean, so they could come back and pull money out of the big pot based on just that documentation piece. Because they're saying that therapy and nursing don't know what each other, that nursing's not backing therapy up and therapy's just treating for money. And see, they're not even us. They're, they're a separate entity, you know, right. or a separate company. So then we have to support that we want them to do it. That's where that comes from. And they really like more, more charting than that, but we haven't gone that far with it if you just, if you just want to take off the order. Thank you for bringing that up. Take off the order and make sure the notification's done. And uh, and you know, you support you know basically uh, that whatever you can say in the note about therapy is assisting therapy pick them up for ambulation strengthening or whatever. Have you seen that in another building or another camp? That's yeah, we always charted therapy services per POC. If they refused it, we charted it. They refused it that day, and why? Mm-hmm. And all that. Um, Medicaid and Medicare have been very strict. They're insurance companies. Mm-hmm. They're very really strict. And um, they want to make sure. And I remember some of the games we used to play that we got paid for. And they weren't all that legitimate, so I can't even complain too much. You know, I do have a question. If you get an order at 11 o'clock at night for eye drops, would you really bother the family? Could you pass them on for day shift and notify? Would you wake someone up for an artificial eye drop? What's been the standard in the past? What? You know, where is our standard on that? I mean, because if it's someone getting up for work at 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock in the morning, I wouldn't want to call for an eye drop if it ain't an emergency. We used to be able to put it on our report sheet where it came from and pass it on a day shift, couldn't notify it. How, how do you want us doing it here? The expectation is notification, without a yeah. doubt. Um, I think that when you give a report, you can say to the nurse, I didn't call them in the middle of the night because this is a saline eye drop. If that nurse box at it, it'll fall back on you. So go call. Okay. Or maybe yeah. the last thing you do before you leave. Yep. At 7 a.m., that that be your call. Well, or it's, it was written at 11 o'clock last night. Right. 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 And, I know. Uh, but yeah. that's what I've told others. Just okay. wait. Make it the last thing you do. Yeah. Um, some nurses don't have an issue with notifying, so it just all depends on what kind of reaction you get. Okay. If it's at 11, they may still be up. It's the 1 in the morning, and I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, and then you learn from family. Some family well, and that's say, the thing I was saying. You know, unless it's a number of the family, 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 don't notify me until 7 a.m. Yeah. Or 6 a.m. We have some family, too. Yeah, have that. we used to note that on their Yeah, and usually they, they are noted. Mm-hmm. It's noted usually mm-hmm. on the chart. They don't want to be called at this time or that time. Yeah. Yeah. But use that within common sense, because we have that with somebody well, else. See, don't notify me before 7 a.m. even if they pass away. Well, you know what, if they pass away, you still notify them when they pass away, mm-hmm. even though they have that in the charts. Well, and that's the thing, I went to another nurse and was like, you know, is this family member gonna get, because I don't want my family right. member right. over little eye drops, you know what I mean? Yeah. And a family member upset, and then we have bad PR, and yeah. And she's like, why would we notify them at this time of night? And I'm like, right. okay. Right, yeah. So it's hard when you're mm-hmm. and you can always around. actually document that what you're thinking. Yeah, you, it never hurts, and then you wait till later to notify them. That makes sense. What I've noticed is state usually can be very reasonable if you if you use your head, you know, especially if they're documentation. Anything else? Well, that's all I have. Yeah.